got lots of people joining in. We're so great to have you today. This is our ECG webinar. Um, we're going to go over a lot of the basics um, and um, a lot of different things. So my name is uh, Dr. Kendall Wyatt. I'm the Academic Content Director at Picmonic. Now, I'm the Academic Content Director today, but this is my last live webinar that I'm going to be doing with Picmonic as far as scheduled. Maybe in the future, who knows, but I'm going off to residency myself. Um, I'm going back to where I'm from in West Virginia and be doing web, uh, webinars and other things there. Um, so if you're looking for me, you can always uh, find me on my personal YouTube. Um, but um, as always, I'll probably be jumping, you know, I might be jumping in the future on some Picmonic stuff, but we'll be working on lots of other things. So I started out as a paramedic and um, then went to nursing school, then went to med school. Um, and I love ACLS. I think ACLS is something that's really like a, a huge, scary thing for so many people. And um, it shouldn't be scary. Um, and that's really, that's really the point is, you know, ACLS shouldn't be something that's scary. This, when you take your first ACLS class, it's 16 hours. Um, that's a lot of stuff. So we're going to focus on a lot of the basics to make you good at interpreting ECGs and good at um, of all the basic things. And we're going to go over a lot of rhythms, and then you're just going to need to practice. Now, if you've not heard of Picmonic before, what we do at Picmonic is we take all the things you need to know, and we take all of the, the things in medicine, and we turn facts into characters. Wow, my voice cracked. I must be going through puberty again. Uh, even the last time was late. I guess the second time past 30, it should happen. Uh, so uh, something like bipolar should be, uh, will turn into a bipolar bear. And if you need to learn about maybe warfarin, the drug, um, you're going to be able to learn about a war fairy inside of Picmonic. You can try it out for free. If you, Lots of you guys are already subscribers. We appreciate that. Um, you can check it out. There's tons of different topics. There's well over 100, 900 topics for nursing, coming everything you need to know, uh, pharmacology, diseases, disorders, um, and all the crazy stuff that you just have so much trouble memorizing when you're in nursing school. And, of course, every other type of medical uh, medical degree. I understand. Now, um, what we're going to go over today, <clears throat> we're going to go over just a really quick hit on some basic anatomy, some high yield points on the anatomy side, but we're also, most importantly, is understanding the blood flow. I really think so many people uh, fail at cardiology because they just don't really understand the blood flow and how to make sure that you memorize that first. It's super important. And understand the concept of it. And I know all the instructors out there, they say concept, concept, concept. Mm -hmm. But in reality, um, you know, that's really... Um, really difficult to kind of grasp. Well, what is the concept? Well, we're going to go over concepts of this stuff today. Um, we're going to go over how to calculate the rate in a very crude, rudimentary form, and then we're going to jump into some rhythms. Now, uh, after that, we'll do some review and Q&A. If you have any particular questions, um, you can check out this recorded version. It will be on Picmonic's YouTube. It's live on there right now. Um, you can check that out on YouTube at Picmonic Video. Just type in Picmonic Video or search Picmonic in YouTube. It's going to pop up. Look at our channel. It'll be the newest one. So let's go and get started. This webinar usually um, usually runs about an hour. Um, it usually takes me a solid hour to go through this. Um, so, um, you know, if you're not planning to hang around for an hour, you can catch up and follow up later. But we do hit literally every high yield point that you need to know, all of the basics. So really, you need to know everything in this one. There's not really much that I say in this webinar that's like, yeah, you can kind of just brush over that. It's not really much here because we've already stripped all that out because we've taken really about 12 hours of what you would learn in ACLS and condensed it all down to an hour in a really rapid fire form. So maybe you need to watch it a couple times, maybe you need to slow it down, and I understand that and I get that, especially if this is your first time um, doing ECGs. Now, um, the one of the things that's important to understand, and this is just one of our Picmonic images, throughout the entire um, webinar today we've got lots of Picmonic images from our system and it's not just a bunch of random images. You can go learn them all in there and check it out, but this is the coronary arteries. Now, one thing that's really important as you're learning coronary arteries is really knowing that there's uh, the um, left coronary artery and the right coronary artery, and they really branch off the main two, um, the main bifurcation. Now, a bifurcation is where something splits, so it's bi, um, bifurcate, bi means two, so it splits and it bifurcates, it creates into two. So you have the left and right, mar um, left and right um, coronary arteries. Now, one thing that's really important to know is that um, for the understanding that basic concept is important because when you go and need to learn 12 lead EKGs, when you go into actually if you're working, um, you know, you need to do some ACLS and advanced things, um, you can really uh, go in and learn and understand a lot of those basics of where the pathology is happening in the heart. And that's about all I'm going to go over with that right now. Now, one thing that is so important, and I just see so many people just brush over this, they learned it in anatomy class, and um, then they, you know, they they just kind of forgot it, or they don't have it at the tip of their tongue, 
is learning the blood flow through the heart. It's so important. Now, I'm not going to go through and, and drill basic uh, rote memory tactics into getting you to memorize it. But what you just you just have to understand that the, the um, you know, we go from capillaries and venules and veins, then into those vena cava, um, into the right atrium. Now, the right atrium and the right side of the heart is all deoxygenated blood through that tricuspid valve um, or through into the uh, right ventricle and then, of course, into the pulmonary artery and the lungs. So um, one of the things as we're going through and talking about this is, um, like I said, you really just, you do have to know this. Um, you need to know it. I'm not going to um, harp on staying on it. But um, what is important is making sure that you um, know that the right atrium deoxygenated, right atrium, then to the right ventricle, then to the lungs. So then the lungs, then the, um, then goes, gets oxygenated, goes back out to the left atrium and the left ventricle, and then out. The point of that is the left ventricle is the largest you know, it's the largest of the heart. It's got to pump out to the entire daggone body, right? I um, mean, it's huge. So it's got to, it's, it's, it's huge. And it really has to, um, really has to pump a lot. So it's going to be a lot bigger. So then if we have that left coronary artery that um, essentially needs to, um, that if that, if that artery gets blocked, then that's the left, the uh, left coronary artery, then we know that that's, that's a, that's a big problem because we're essentially cutting off all of the blood slide to blood supply to the, um, to the biggest part of the heart that's pumping. And that's what's really, um, really becomes a problem. Now, when you think about this, this is great when you go and you think about heart failure, which we've got videos on all that stuff um, and all the other things, heart failure and all of the other diseases as well. You can think about how some, you know, something as simple as a myocardial infarction can essentially cause, then maybe cause a lot of problems. Um, it can cause, um, <clears throat> and you can think about the pathology that goes along with it. So I like to think about this with my wonderful fish tank method. Whoops, before we um, jump into this. So I just think of the body as a fish tank. These all go together. The pipes are the veins and arteries. The pump itself, the heart, which is what we're talking about for electrical rhythms. The aerator in every great fish tank, you need something to pump oxygen in there. So we've got our lungs. And then the tank and the fluid is just like the fish tank itself with water, which of course is the actual body keeping everything together in the blood. And then everything needs a great filter like the kidneys. And we've got these little filter kidneys here. I got my orange cup here today with me. Um, so it, uh, I, my mouth gets dry, so I always have to take a, a little drink. Now let's jump into EKG stuff. Now that we're finally going. Wow, it's just, um, that's painful. So one of the things I want to talk about are, um, the electrical physiology of the heart. Now, when we talk about the electrical physiology, we know that we have to talk about the sinoatrial node. We've got this, um, sinus, <clears throat> sinus atrial, sinoatrial node here. We've got our little a little spark plug. And that's what's really important to know that it's at the top of the heart. So electrical activity comes from up here and it comes down from the right side of the heart all the way down to the left ventricle. It comes from the sinoatrial node to the AV node. We've got our little aviator uh, wearing heart. And then of course it goes to the bundle of his and we've got our hissing snakes and then um, down to the Purkinje fibers and out to the rest of the heart. Now, when you think about this conduction system, what you really need to know is that each one does different speeds. And this is an important concept, again, to think about. Because what happens is it's really like a backup system. You know, it's like having a buddy system, and if one fails, then the other one's going to um, step in and help out. So what happens is the sinoatrial node, they all have different rates which they kind of kick in at. And that's really the concept to think about. So when you think about somebody who then has a heart block, which we're not going to go into the ECG of heart blocks, but they have a heart block, so they have blocked the electrical system that person is not going to have a fast rate, right? They're going to have a very slow rate. So let's talk through that. So if you talk about the SA node, the sinoatrial node, it has a regular beat, a, a, an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100 beats a minute. That's essentially, essentially a, sin, a sinus rhythm, right? A sinus rhythm is intended and matches a sinoatrial node firing from the sinoatrial node because it's essentially firing from the normal place and firing correctly. And that's really what you can think about. So it fires from that right atrium, the SA node, comes down to the right atrium, down into the, <clears throat> uh, uh, the AV junction, the AV node, it's often called, or the atrioventricular junction. Now, the AV node is the second spot that it, it gets electricity. So it comes to the SA node to the AV node, then it comes all the way down and then essentially um, fires throughout the rest of the heart. Well, if the SA node um, fails, if something happens and you have a heart block, a blocked conduction pathway, essentially what happens is the AV node can take over. It can work all by itself because that's one of the great properties, but sometimes albeit bad properties of the heart is that they're, they're automatic. They can conduct themselves. And if I'm energized and I'm in a cardiac cell, my buddy over here who's a cardiac cell, if I'm electrified and I go and I shock him, 
he's going to fire right beside me. So it conducts all the way throughout the, the heart tissue as well. And that's one of the great things so that the AV node can essentially fire in the middle of the heart. And that's where you see all those weird problems where you see inverted inversions of like the, um, uh, the QRS complex because it's, it looks weird, but that's because of a probable problem. And there's very identifiable patterns that we see on the, on the ECG oh. that we're able to keep track of. Um, so um, um, the last part is the, are the Purkinje fibers. So down from the AV node here, out down, then we have these Purkinje fibers and they go out through the ventricles. The Purkinje fibers are the backup. They come in at 20 to 40 um, intrinsic rate. Um, and then they're really just kind of the, the true backup system. Uh, somebody, uh, uh, sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Uh, Stenitis says um, that they heard Stitch. And that's right. So um, since usually I put Stitch in another room and kind of hide him off to the side, but he's, uh, he's here with me today. Um, so if he does bark, I'm sorry, but he's, he kind of has dependency issues. So um, as I talked about the cardiac cells themselves, they're automatic and they conduct themselves. They're excite, they excite themselves as well as they are contractile. Now, that's a, bunch of, that's a bunch of basic stuff. Let's talk about ECGs themselves. When we talk about the ECG, you got to know the parts. I mean, if you don't know, uh, it's like reading the user manual. You have to know the basics before you can really just dive in. Otherwise, you're destined to fail. So let's talk about this. So we have the P wave. Now, one of the things I talk about are the PQRST. And when I hear people talk about it, they're like, oh, I can't remember that. If you can remember the alphabet, you can remember the PQRST. So just remember that the P starts first. Um, now, I know usually peeing is last, but in this case, we're going to think about uh, the P first. So um, when we talk about the P wave, what happens, the P wave is the first deflection above this isometric line. The isometric line is essentially this imaginary line of wherever the ECG kind of um, resonates to a base. So we have this. So this would be on the isometric line before the P wave. So that first deflection above the isometric line is the P wave. Um, and then we've got the Q, which is usually the QRS complex, which we're going to talk about again in a sec. And then the last is the T wave, or the T, and that's the deflection after the QRS complex. And we need to know um, what each of them do. Now, we've got um, a wonderful picmonic to help you with this. You can go check it out. We've got a little queen and then a little R rocket, um, our little S for shooting down, and then, of course, our T trophy to help you remember P, Q, R, S, T, as well as learning them. Now, one of the things you've really got to know is you just got to understand what's going on with each of the pieces of the ECG. So the P wave essentially is atrial depolarization. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means the atria are depolarizing, right? Well, that means they are discharging, and essentially that's the electrical contraction, the electrical activity that's causing contraction, depolarization. And of course, it creates a little indentation. And then the QRS complex itself, so from the start to where the Q deviates down the isometric line all the way to where the S returns the isometric line, the QRS complex is ventricular depolarization. So that's where the ventricles depolarize. The electrical activity fires and the ventricles depolarize, which essentially should equal contraction. Now, what's interesting about ECGs is that just because there's electrical activity, that does not necessarily mean that the actual muscle is doing that. An ECG is only measuring the electrical activity. So of course we have something called um, pulseless electrical activity, right? Where it looks like there's a heart rhythm, but there's actually no heartbeat, there's no pulse. And that's really important because it's just sporadic electrical activity caused it, that happens that's measured on electric on an ECG because that's exactly what an ECG does. So um, you can go in and um, again check out those different pieces. Here's just an example of the picmonic how we talk about atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, and then um, repolarization of the ventricles. Now here's where um, you really just need to make sure that you understand this concept. The ECG paper itself is super important to know how it works. Um, and uh, you've got to really understand, to be able to calculate the heart rate, it's actually really simple. So many people get caught up on math with this, and they just get so um, confused, and they're just, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what to do, or I, I can't really get it. Um, all you have to do is, um, essentially, then we have to, you have to look at the, um, uh, the, the little tiny boxes. And this is a great example here. But what the, t the point is, is each box breaks into smaller boxes until you've got to the tiniest little box. I think I've got this on the next slide. Yep, I do. So on the tiniest little box, here, right here, we've got the tiniest little box. You need to remember that one, and that's it. You need to remember 0 0.04 seconds. That's what you've got to memorize. 
If you memorize that, you can build off of that to all of the times and how the, the ECG measures. Because when you have the printout of ECG paper, you may have green paper or blue paper, or maybe you have, I don't know, rainbow paper. Good for you. I'd like to see some. But the point is, um, it's usually, you know, it all looks the same. It's all the same grid. And inside of here, from left to right, it measures time in seconds. And then measuring the height is essentially measuring, um, uh, we could say, maybe the intensity um, as a generalized term. Yes, I know that's not, if you're, if you're, if you're super nerdy, that's not intense entirely correct, but that's that's enough of a concept to understand what's going on. So 0 0.04 seconds. So what happens is, yeah, the, the green paper for sure. Um, so the, um, uh, the what happens is the 0 0.04, the tiniest little boxes, everything goes in multiples of five here. So you got to remember the multiples of five. So if you remember that five of the smallest boxes in here going across right here, as they're evidenced right here, that equals um, 0.2 seconds, 0 0.2 seconds. So five, 0 0.04 times five is 0 0.2 seconds. So it's one fifth of a second, that's correct. So then of course, if I have five of these sets of the tiniest five small boxes, then that equals one second in duration across. So that's essentially 25 of the smallest boxes of 0 .0, 0 0.04 seconds. Um, and when I say that out loud and everybody hears it for the first time, they think, wow, that's, that's confusing. And I know it sounds like a lot of numbers thrown at once, but it's essentially 0 0.04 seconds at the smallest one. Now, whoever thought of this, man, they're super smart people because what happens is we need to know what, what's so important that we need to know about, um, what, what, what is so important about this 0 0.2 seconds? What's so important about that one? Why is that such an important number? Why is it such an important number? Well, that's right. The 0 0.2 seconds is where we measure heart blocks. We're measuring that period of time, and that measures heart blocks, and that's exactly right. So with that, um, moving on there, the biggest thing you've got to do next is be able to calculate the heart rate, the heart rate essentially. Now, I like to use just a simple example, um, and yes, I am simplifying this. No, it's not going to work 100% of the time, but it's going to get you so close that you can always get close enough with your answer. Now, when you look at a, a six-second strip, how do we know it's a six-second strip? Well, what's really great is, see how this is one second right here? What's the minimum amount of time we really know we need to have to interpret a proper EKG? Six seconds, right? So what's really cute is that inside of these, at the bottom of every paper, there are lines. There are lines that, that jettison down from the bottom, and they're usually little black lines. Now, there's variations in this, yes. But the point is that these variations in, sec in, in, in these little lines are usually at three second intervals. So they're usually three second intervals and then they jump over. So there's three and then th that's three seconds and then that's three seconds. So if I count one, two, three lines or in between two and skip over one line, that's a distance of six seconds. Now, what you don't wanna do is waste your time and try to count all the tiny little boxes inside here. Well, how can you do that? Well, see these bolded lines all of the ECG paper is bolded inside of here. So it's bolded inside of here and it's bolded and then it counts across over the lines. So that's five, that breaks it up into five. And then there's an even bolder, darker line for another multiple of five. And that's absolutely correct. Um, so you can just go from here and then go over to the, nether, um, the other multiple of five. So that's just where it works. But what we need to get is a six second strip. So if you know your ECG, you know the basics, PQRST, then we can identify here, look at this, these, lo these long lines. So there's a long line, here's a long line, and here's a long line. So that's one, and then there's two, so that's three seconds in between there, and then there's three seconds in between here. This particular paper actually counts every one second for us with a tiny little line. But just remember the longest signs, uh, the longest line. So that's, that's three seconds, and this is three seconds. So we've got a six second strip. Well, how do we get a heart rate speed? Literally, super simple. All you have to do is identify the, the QRS complexes and count those. Multiply it by 10. That's it. So let's look at this. So here we've got a, a P, a QRS, and a T. The P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, and P, QRS, T. So here's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and there's five. So there are five QRS complexes in this six-second strip. So all I have to do is take the, the five QRS complexes, 
How do I then take, know the heart rate? I multiply that by 10, and that means I've got a heart rate of about 50 here on this example. Now I say about because I can also, um, there's another way I can measure, um, I can measure the, um, the, uh, the heart rate. Uh, lots of you guys have jumped over to um, the YouTube, and yes, YouTube is delayed. Um, uh, it's delayed a little bit, so if you, you just haven't caught up, that's good. So you didn't miss anything. So um, we, I put, a, I did put a delay on YouTube um, the way we stream it, uh, just for tech, you know, technology's sake. I don't, there's no rule against it, but it's just, I don't know. Seems like fun. So if I look at this six second strip, so there I've got one, two, three, four, five. So I've got a, about a heart rate of 50 because I multiply that by 10 and that's absolutely correct. Um, so I, I can multiply that by five and that's gonna give me a heart rate of about 50. So now what if I need an exact heart rate? Well, here's where the, the, the question comes in. Almost all of the time, unless you're literally taking an ECG class at this particular time and you're getting lots of ECGs and getting just literally drilled on them, the quick method always works. It's going to get you close enough. Almost always, you're going to get answers that are going to be far away. Um, you're going to see an answer um, that's 40, you know, 50, and you're going to see an answer that's 70, see an answer that's 30, and see an answer that's, you know, 26. So it's very close. Which one's the closest is most likely to be your answer. But if you need an exact answer, what you can do is count the number of boxes or the amount of time between the R to R interval. So here's a PQ to PQR. This is an R wave. So I can count the difference in time between the R's and, and, and see how much time that is total. I could count every little tiny box, or I could count the multiples of five. So there's three, so eight, uh, so wait, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So there's 33. I multiply 33 pi times 0 0.04, which is going to give me 1.32 seconds. And then I just take 60 and divide it by 1.32, and it's going to give me the exact heart rate of 45. All of the ECG um, monitors and all the heart monitors out there, what they do is they actually count from the R to R. They, they, they're able to identify where the R wave is, and they calculate the exact difference in real time of the R waves to give you an exact heart rate. Now, one of the things that, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about that site. Um, so, anyway, um, looks like a couple of people are having, a, having some interesting um, uh, troubles there on the um, still on the go to webinar thing. I can't keep um, like freezing it. I don't know. It's, I can't fix it. Unfortunately, I don't know that it, it's anything maybe out of my control. But um, the um, uh, one thing is important. You can jump over to the YouTube um, and then you just you just need the link and you can see it there um, to get it. I there was a new update to the software, so I I don't know why it's um, definitely not working. Um, so. Um, uh, but you don't need any kind of login or anything to, to view the live webinar. You just need the link. Um, you just go to our page and click there. So it looks like most of the people have jumped over to there um, as well. So um, the link is there. You should be able to see it. Marley can jump on and give you the link, um, and, and Marley will help you out. Um, so um, one of the things, the next things is um, let's try an example of our heart rate speed here. So here's our six-second um, uh, ECG. What's the heart rate? What's the heart rate here? What do you think the heart rate is? Well, what do you got to do? Well, what you have to do is you have to count those. I mean, you could count the distance between the R to R, but that takes too long. We need to be fast. I mean, you only get a minute and 20 seconds on these questions when you're taking your boards, right? So, I mean, what's, what do you need to do? Well, you need to count the, the how many R QRS complexes are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's about eight. So this heart rate is about 80. And almost all the time, literally almost every single time, you're going to be able to know exactly what's here, and um, then you're going to be able to see if that's a heart, a slow rate, or a fast rate. We're going to talk about that. So I'm not going to go into the too much into the intervals themselves, um, just because I'm running behind. I don't know if it's because I'm talking so much or because the uh, the go to webinar mess ups distracting me. But um, uh, we talked about the P wave itself. There's something called the PR interval. And we know the PR interval needs to be less than 0 0.2 seconds. Now, what does that match to again? Remember those five tiny blocks, the five block of five, that's 0 0.2 seconds. So that's five blocks. And what happens is that's a delay in conduction speed from the atria going down to the ventricles, from the SA node to the AV node. It's a delay. And when it delays, it's delayed because it's blocked. Oh my God, somebody was so smart who thought of this stuff, right? Because it just makes sense. So if this is delayed, that's called a heart block. Um, and there are lots of different types of heart blocks, but essentially, the number one sign of a heart rate is a uh, heart block. Sorry, is a delayed PR interval, which means it's greater than 0.2 seconds. 
Now we've got our QRS complex, which needs to be less than um, 0.12 seconds or 0.1, but I like to use 0.2 just because it's so, um, it's three boxes again. Um, and again, if you can see more than three block boxes in there, that means it's delayed and it's going slow. That means the, um, the, the depolarization process is going slow throughout the ventricles. That happens often because of conduction problems and other injuries and, and myocardial infarctions and whatnot. We've got the, um, the QT interval. The QT interval is from the Q to the T. So it's essentially, it's the, essentially the distance from um, the time that the heart depolarizes to the time the heart repolarizes, or the ventricles, I mean. Why is that so important? Well, when we think about that, what happens is we can have something called R on T phenomenon. And what happens is R on T, well, the R is on the T. And the heart is trying to depolarize and repolarize at exactly the same, the right time. And it's because that time gets stretched out and then it causes this abnormality. And that's where we get sudden death. Um, that's where you, that's why, one of the reasons why we have um, these type of phenomenons are one of the uh, reasons why we have uh, defibrillators in every single school and every single thing now um, because of this abnormality and then of course it needs to be shocked and it, the heart goes back into rhythm. Um, that's just, you know, and then of course there are lots of drugs out there that cause QT prolongation that you need to know about. The ST segment is the most common thing, of course, that's from the S, a QRS to the where the T begins to deflect above the isometric line, the ST segment, and of course that, um, that particular segment is where um, you can um, uh, measure uh, basically uh, cardiac injury, essentially. That's where we see that cardiac injury, ischemia, or death. Now, there's a couple of other important ones, and, and um, you really got to know these. I've just got the most important ones here. I talked about that prolonged QT already, but what about a U wave? Where do we see a U wave? I didn't even mention the letter U yet. But it's like, it's like I'm, uh, oh, goodness, what is that, guys? Like, let's talk about the letter U. Hmm? What's, what's the U? Well, the U wave is PQRST and then U. Essentially, it's another wave out here after the T wave. It's another one. There's another little wave. It's not another P wave, um, and I don't want you to concern it for that because it's really difficult to be able to identify a U wave. Most commonly, you're going to be told about a U wave, and then you need to know that it involves potassium. And exactly in the, in the opposite, this tall peaked, um, uh, it involves a low potassium, so hypokalemia. And I just remember that U wave is shaped like a U, so it's you know a decreasing, uh, decreasing potassium. Now, when we talk about the T wave, this tall peaked T wave, this one you're going to see very often as well. And here's a great example. So I got my my P is is right here, kind of hard to see. QRS. And I got this giant T wave. I mean, it almost looks like a QRS complex. It's bigger than, um, but it's after the QRS, and it's a giant T wave. It's a tall peaked T wave. Number one sign of hyperkalemia in the tall peaked T wave. Um, and that's really important to make sure that you know. Um, a tall peaked T wave. So um, it's just make sure that you know that stuff. Um, those are two ones that they're so commonly tested. But also, if you have a patient that's just fidgeting, you know, or twitching out of control and they're having problems and they're a renal patient, then you find out that, you know, the tall peaked T wave. Well, that's because, you know, you're going to see that on the ECG and you're like, wow, that person may have hyperkalemia. Look how tall, look at that T wave. That's crazy. Um, and of course, then you can treat that. But remember that potassium is very, 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 um, car cardiac, it's very, um, it affects the cardiac system a lot. It affects the heart and imbalances are, uh, the heart's very sensitive to those imbalances. That's why we can see it on the ECG. And of course, it causes um, arrhythmias uh, very easy. So here's just our, our uh, potassium pycmonics. You can go check that out if you want. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip. I kind of already talked about each one of these, um, but I want to talk about ST, uh, the ST segment. So as we look at the the um, the ST segment, this um, segment right in here, this between the ST, we know that the ST segment essentially can be um, can be what. What is the ST segment? Well, the ST segment, if you're thinking, you're, you're thinking about cardiac injury. Yes, that's absolutely right. So you're thinking about cardiac injury. The answer is yes. Um, it's not, um, it can be cardiac ischemia and then cardiac infarction. So ischemia just means oxygen starvation. So it just means that the, you know, it's oxygen deprived, whereas ischemia actually means cell death. So if we have cardiac um, ischemia, we may see a depressed ST segment. But if we have cardiac ischemia, a true, you know, infarction, that's where we see that ST segment elevation. Um, and that's absolutely, um, absolutely right. 
So that's where um, you'll see that, and that's just really important to make sure that you know those. Here's our little ST, uh, ST segment deviations. These are important to knowing in, um, in uh, infarction. Here's some examples. So here we've got under the B here. Here we see this P, QRS, but the S doesn't ever go back to the isometric line. Well, that's because we got our S. The S is almost gone, but it's there. I mean, it's, you got to understand it's going to be where it comes down and it starts deviating back to the new isometric line, what it thinks is. And then we got coming over to the T and then back all the way down. Opposite of that, over here under our C example, we've got our P, QRS, and then it comes way down below the isometric line before coming back above um, to the T wave. So somebody asked about, um, uh, will the T wave be obvious, uh, Stephanie? Um, and how big is the T wave going to be in, in hyperkalemia and the, and the changes? It really just depends on the severity of the potassium imbalance. Um, it could be huge. Um, it could be like the example that you see there, but you're probably going to see other types of cyst, uh, symptoms. It may not be obvious, but what it may not be is it may not be a beautiful rounded. It may look like a TP. It may not be very big, but it's, it looks like a TP, and that's because it's literally rapidly depolarizing straight up and straight down. It may look very pointed, and that's why we call it tall and peaked T waves. Um, and you can, there's, you know, there are algorithms being able to ch check the T wave to the QRS complex. That's the physiology stuff. I'm going to go into that uh, for what we're going to talk about now. Now, when we look at a myocardial infarction, the ST elevation that you see could be very different. And I don't want you to focus on trying to always identify ST elevation. I see so many people learning ECG in the beginning, and they're just so focused on trying to find ST elevation that they're not focused on making sure that they're just good at reading ECGs. So there's just some examples. So they can always look differently. Look how this one looks different from this one. Um, this one looks different from this one. These are all ST segment elevation. So there's no P wave in any of these, that's on purpose. But QRST, QRST, um, then we got a QRST, and then we got a QRST. So it's gonna look different, and it's based on the ev excuse me, the evolution of the myocardial infarction itself. So um, all of that, lots of basics, lots of things to understand. I get it. If you don't understand um, all of the basic stuff, I recommend making sure you really know that, but number one, you've really got to know how you can calculate a good rate. Um, that's what's super important. You've got to be able to calculate a rate, and you've got to be able to know how to, to get the rate correct and make sure that that is um, indeed working. Um, and that is, that's definitely one of the things that you, you just have to know. Um, so um, let's actually, we're going to go through some rhythms, but first thing, um, when you learn anything, I think when you're learning any type of new skill, and I, I, I'm not somebody who usually harps on so many basic things, but you've got to learn a process. It's just like baking a cake, doing ECGs. It's like doing anything. You've got to follow a very certain pattern, otherwise you're guaranteed to make mistakes because then you're going to just keep ending up with, what do I do now? This one looks weird. Ooh, that's not what you really, uh, that's what's going to happen to you if you don't follow the pattern. And we've got a pattern here for you. If you've learned ECGs in a little bit different order, that's probably okay. Um, so you don't have to follow my order exactly, but it is a set order that it does uh, equal success every single time. And then there's the weird crap at the other, you know, the end where all the, there's a few anomalies that you just have to know. And we'll talk about some of those as we go through. So one of the, as we go through, this is what everything we're going to run through today. Um, we're going to go through, if anything, making sure you're a master of the process because that's what's going to make you um, be able to understand what's going on and just not make any of the, um, what I want to call basic mistakes, right? The, the, the things where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I missed that. Because that's where so many people with, with ECGs, they miss those. They miss the basic stuff. And I, if you're saying it's not one of you, one, you're not that person, I'm telling you, I worked as a paramedic for a long time and that's one of the big paramedic skills is doing ECGs. Oh, I was so bad. I didn't realize how bad I was until I relearned it and always follow the same process now. And I think that's really, um, uh, use my learning example. Don't, just you know, don't 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 do what I did. So we're going to talk about first. We're going to go through looking at the rate, and we're going to run through this each one. We're going to look at the rate, and we're going to determine the rate. That's the most important thing because then you know is it is the heart going too fast or is it going too slow? We're going to look at the rhythm of what's going on. We're going to see if it's doing the same thing if it's if it's regular or if it's irregular. Then we're gonna, if it's irregular, we're gonna break that down. We're gonna say, is it doing the same thing every time or is it just doing a bunch of weird crap? After that, we're gonna look at the P waves and we're gonna say three questions. We're gonna say, is there one before every single QRS? Are they upright? Are they consistent? 
upright, rounded, uh, and consistent. Then we're going to look at that PR interval, making sure that it's less than 0 0.2 seconds for what? Heart block, yes. And then we're going to look at uh, the QRS complex itself. We're going to look at the QRS complex, and, we're gonna, and basically all the last one is like, is it wide or is it short, right? Is it greater than um, zero? I like to say three boxes, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and you see some variation in the text on, on 0 0.1 second, seconds. Woo! There's a little Freudian flip for you. And then 0 0.12 seconds. But you're going to see that. And then I just, I always just in my mind think three boxes because I know three tiny boxes are 0 0.04 seconds apiece times three, 0 0.12, mainly because I'm a math nerd. Now we're going to look through this and we're going to run through these examples and we're actually going to run through this together. So if you didn't catch all this, don't freak out. I didn't intend for you to, I, I didn't intend to harp on this giant list because we're literally going to run through this every single one. And as we start with the basics, a basic regular rhythm, we're going to build each one and we're going to go through it and we're going to see how we're building through the process. Because if you can get the easy ones, then you can move to the harder ones and the harder ones and the harder ones. Yep, you'll get it. So let's talk about a sinus rhythm, okay? I'm not going to go in, I'm not going to read all of this crap to you because I think it's a waste of time. Um, you can watch this later. You can scribble it down. Um, I think I've got the DVR turned on YouTube, so you can actually pause it um, and stop me. And I'm st it's still going to be playing on YouTube, and you can stop me and make some notes, and then you can push play again. It's all there. I, I, I'm pretty sure I turned on the DVR thing. It's one of the great things I love on there. But what's really important is a sinus rhythm. Well, what does a sinus rhythm mean? Well, a sinus rhythm means it originated, hopefully, from the sin sinoatrial node and traveled down through the right path to the AV node and then out. Sinoatrial node. So that means it originated from the sinoatrial node, sinus rhythm. That's where that comes from. Um, sinus doesn't mean your nose sinus. It means normal, regular, expected, um, all those whatever synonyms. Now, when we look at this, here's the same pattern. You're going to notice this exact same thing, rate rhythm, P waves, PR interval, QRS. It's going to look the same way on every single one of these we look at. You don't have to go into the details on each one. Um, and when I talk about the leads and all this stuff, I, don't even worry about that stuff when you're starting out. Um, I, I mean, I think you need to know lead placement, and that's a separate a separate talk. I had to cut it out of this because it's just too much stuff. Um, but um, one of the things, so you got the rate, rhythm, P waves, PR interval, QRS. In a sinus rhythm, Let's look at the rate first. What is the rate? Let's say this is a six second rhythm. What's the rate here? Someone tell me the rate. So somebody count. I can't count today. I should make like a cheat sheet for myself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's about eight. Actually, this is the same rhythm I just showed you a minute ago. So that I just realized that. So the rate is about 80, right? Now, when I say the rate, when I talk about fast and slow, what's a normal heart rate? You got to know that one. 60 to 100 beats in an adult. 60 to 100. Is it faster than 100 or lower than 60? No, it's normal. That means it's a normal rate, rate, regular. Now rhythm, now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Rhythm, you've gotta be able to say, is this doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over? Yes or no? Now how do we do that? Now the first time I'm gonna explain it to you with the perfect one, and then when we get into the harder ones, you're gonna to have to, you're gonna to have to, we're gonna to, to have to do some, some finger motion. I like to use my thumb. So when we look at the rhythm, the way you tell if the rhythm is regular, what you actually have to do is you have to check between, you have to look at the R to R interval. So here's the R, there's an R, there's an R, there's an R, there's an R, you, you get the point, right? And then you have to say, are they regular? Now I like to use the thumb method here. This is my, my beautiful thumb. I, I have the most beautiful thumbs that anybody has ever had in the world. These are the best thumbs, and I know thumbs, okay? So I like to just literally every time, whether it's on an ECG monitor, whether it's on uh, anything, I literally just thumb it. And I take my thumb, and I literally just put my thumb right up there, and I, I angle it to where it's about right, and I just eyeball it, and I'm like, yep. It's almost the same distance all the way across. There's no wide variations. Thanks, Duckbutt3385. Great name, by the way. Thanks for the thumb, the thumb compliment. Uh, for you guys on GoToWebinar, uh, Duckbutt3385 just gave me a compliment about my thumb. So what you need to do is see if it's regular. As it, is it the same distance? What you're looking for is you want to see if one's scrunched together or one's farther apart. That would be maybe not irregular, and we're going to talk about that. But you don't just have to look at the R to R's. To truly say that it's regular, you have to look at the P to P's too. So you got to look at the P to P's. So you're going to be able to identify. So there's the P, so P, Q, R, S, T, right? 
So there's my P, and there's my other P, 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 P. And I'm doing this one slowly on purpose because you're going to have to be able to do this, and it gets harder. Of course it gets harder. That's the whole point. That's why this is a difficult subject. But what, what the important thing here is, is that you've got to be able to understand the basics. So this is the normal rhythm. I'm telling you it's normal. And when we look at harder ones, then you're going to have to be able to figure it out. Um, somebody asked, is there a, is there a handout? Um, you can always um, you can always check this out on YouTube. Um, you can I do have a PDF of some sample rhythms for you to try, and I'll post it in the link of the video afterwards, or I'll send it out in the email. It's it's just a rough set of rhythms, and you can just try them on your own, um, and then it has the answers. But um, as far as a handout, you just kind of have to watch the YouTube. Um, but um, Getting back to our regular, look at our piece. So I take my beautiful thumb again, the best thumb in the world. I mean, I know thumbs. This is there's no thumb better than this one. Um, magical thumbs. Then I take it and I put it down there, and I'm looking at the dis distance again. So I'm looking at the distance, and of course, when I look all the way across, they're very close. Now, when I say close, I mean if, we're, if it's a, if it's one one box away, two boxes away, perfectly normal. We're not trying to micro scrutinize this. This is a rough thing, and and it's you know it's supposed to be because what is one thing that will create a variation in a heart rate in a normal healthy individual and you got to know about this for real life on the test they're not going to give it to you but um, actually i think i have a slide on this so i don't maybe i shouldn't talk about it but one of the things that changes your heart rate is breathing if i take a big deep breath what happens if i hold that big deep breath in or i took a big giant big deep breath i've increased the pressure in my heart or in my intra intrathoracic cavity, I caused pressure, increased pressure. My heart then can't fill as easily, so my heart rate needs to speed up a little bit, and that's called an you know, a sinus arrhythmia. It's a little beat that's just going to be a little bit off place. That's perfectly normal. If you're seeing it slowly speed up just a little bit over a couple of beats, perfectly normal. We're not, I think I have an example here to like look at. Now, looking at the rest of it, the rest of it is super easy. Uh, for this, I look at the P waves and I say, are they upright? Normal, is there one before every single QRS? Yes, 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 there is. Then I look at the PR interval all the way across, beautiful. I mean, there's no way I've got five boxes in between there. Not a chance. Then I look at the QRS, there's not a chance, literally just even glancing at it. Is there more than three boxes in between that QRS? Not a chance. I don't even need to look at all of them and tell you all the way across, absolutely not. So when you kind of condition yourself, you quickly get um, the basics, and it would still basic stuff. Then when we start doing these faster, we're going to go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, right? Um, that's the idea. So let's look at this one. Tell me what the rate is. This is a six-second strip. You have just a few seconds. What's the rate? The rate is about yeah, 50, right? The rate is approximately 50. Approximately. Now, 50, is that between 60 to 100? No. Is it fast or slow? It's slow. It's a slow rate. It's approximately 50. It's a bradycardic rhythm. Now, is the rhythm regular? Ooh, I could have a little bit bigger thumbs for this one. Uh, look all the way, my, my R to R's, yes. I look at my P to P's. P to P to P, 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 all the way across. Beautiful, very consistent. Is there one uh, P wave? P, Q, R, S, T, 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 P, Q, R, S, T. Yes, beautiful. Um, so if I look at that, um, and uh, then I look at this rhythm, when I look at the P wave, how do I know that this is a sinus rhythm? I did, forgot to mention this on the last one. I know that this is a, a sinus rhythm because there's a P wave there. It's there before every QRS. That means it's, uh, and it's positive, it's upright. It's upright and is one before every QRS. That P wave right there, that little nugget, that P wave tells me that that originated from the sinoatrial node, meaning it's a sinus bradycardia. So it's originating from the sinus uh, the sinoatrial node, there's one before every QRS, that means it probably caused it, right? Yes. And that means then that that's a um, uh, sinus bradycardia. So that means it originated from the sinoatrial node. Come here, Stitch. Sorry, my uh, Stitcher's here is about to, to um, ha have a moment, I think. I don't want him to bark. So, um, uh, the, um, so that's how I know that that's a sinus bradycardia. So, um, Jack, for you, just important to make sure you know, and I, maybe you're answering something because uh, there is a little bit of a delay, but what's important to think about when you, when you say um, bradycardia, make sure you're always saying sinus bradycardia. 
um, because if it's not sinus bradycardia, then you know um, that it may be, um, that's where we get into something called junctional rhythms. Junctional because of the a, AV junction, that means it didn't originate from the SA node. If there's no P wave, that means it's junctional. That's just a side note. We'll talk about that here in a second. So let's look at this one. Someone tell me the rate. Thirteen, thirteen, right? Thirteen, hundred and thirty. The rate's about one hundred and thirty. Beautiful. Now let's look at the rhythm. You got to have really tiny thumbs for this one, and I don't have tiny thumbs. I have big, beautiful thumbs. But if you have tiny thumbs, wow! I couldn't imagine if you're on a if you're on a mobile device and you're really trying to use your thumbs. But um, uh, if you look there, it's regular. The R to R all the way across is beautiful. The P to P. Now, I know it's hard to see those P waves, but they're there. Look, they're right there, P, P. And as the rhythms get faster, it's harder to see the P waves. Yes, it's absolutely right. It's like it's like having a toddler just stitching. It's just like a toddler. Um, so that's absolutely right, and it's regular. And the R to R, also regular. So R, 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 all the way across. Now there's a P wave. Is there one before every QRS? Yes. Is it upright? Yes. That means this is a fast rate, right? Because 130 is above 100. That's right. We did math. And that means it's a tachycardic rhythm. So you say tachycardia first. Then when you look at and you say, um, you say regular, yes. Then we say P waves. There's one before every QRS. That means it's sinus tachycardia. So then we've added tachycardia. Now we say it's sinus tachycardia. And that's how we know exactly what it is. PR interval. Of course, on a, on a fast rate, it's really hard to see um, a true heart block. So we're going to look here. There's no way there's any of those are greater than 0 0.2 seconds. So from here to here, no. There's literally one, one or two boxes in between there, right? And that's how we know it's sinus tachycardia. QRS, just glancing at those, you know there's no chance that there's three boxes in between there, right? No, there's not. That means it's, QRS is perfectly fine. So um, not a problem at all. So this is a um, sinus tachycardia all the way across. Beautiful. Uh, doo, doo, doo. Now let's talk about um, uh, some tachydysrhythmias, rhythms that basically, lots of different rhythms that are too fast. Now these are some of the ones that people have trouble with. Because sinus tachycardia itself is a toughie. Um, and I'm surprised somebody didn't, didn't point this out. But um, sinus tachycardia itself is is difficult and the point is um you know it only in this example it says 101 to 180 beats now that doesn't mean after 180 it's not sinus tachycardia but we have other names for it that's right so let's talk about these um these two fast rhythms let me just scoot back because stitch is sitting on my lap he's a pain in the butt today um so uh first off first one i want to talk about so we're talking about things that are too fast we're going to talk about um, uh, tacky dysrhythmias. So if we talk about tacky dysrhythmias, we can talk about um, uh, ones that are too fast, like supraventricular tachycardia. We're talking about tachycardia, right? So what does supraventricular tachycardia mean? Well, that means that the um, the heart the um, the electrical activity I can't even talk today. All of a sudden, the electrical activity arises. Um, above the ventricles. That means the electrical activity rises above the ventricles and um, is uh, supraventricular. So what happens is it causes a, ta a tachycardia, and there's a couple different kinds. I'm not going to talk about each one of them, but essentially what happens most commonly is either overexcitation of the SA node from things like caffeine um, and um, you know uh, nicotine, um, stress, lots of different things. There's, but the big one, you know, caffeine is a huge trigger for what we call supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. Um, and of course, you know, whenever we look at treating rhythms um, and treating any type of rhythm itself, what we need to know is, is the patient symptomatic? I mean, anytime we have a uh, ECG uh, abnormality, so even sinus bradycardia, we, may, we don't have to treat sinus bradycardia unless it's symptomatic because we know athletes, which I'm not in the athlete category, they have big strong hearts, so their hearts beat slower. They're, they're normally bradycardic and of course um, would be normally slow. Sit down, Stitch, you're gonna have to sit down. Uh, they're gonna be normally slow and then of course um, you don't have to treat them. You don't just start giving atropine to everyone because they have a slow heart rate um, because it may be normal. So we treat symptomatic patients. Same with SVT. 
Uh, so let's look at a couple of these. A couple of, there's also a way where we have, um, before I forget, uh, malt re-entry uh, SVT. So it essentially can be caused by um, other accessory pathways that basically, here's a good example right here in this one. So atrial tachycardia, which we have a slide on, and then um, just re-excitation of that AV node causing, um, causing uh, overstimulation. So I love this term, uh, paroxysmal. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Wow, what a fun word, right? Say that 10 times fast. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or PSVT or SVT. PSVT means paroxysmal. That means that it's, um, that means it's um, eh, transient, right? Just like my thought right at the moment. It's transient. It was there, and then I lost it. Um, Nicole on, on YouTube thinks um, Stitch is drunk. He may, he may be drunk. I don't know. Um, so paroxysmal means that it comes on and it goes away. So how do we check this? And look at this rhythm. Most of you on the rhythms, if, you, if you're not really comfortable with ECGs, you're going to look at this one and you're like, I have no idea what's going on. But anytime you're looking at a rhythm, if you get one that you just really can't tell and you're able to get a longer portion of a rhythm, uh, bigger, bigger section, that's great. That's what you should do because what you want to do is see what was happening like things are chugging along great. So look at this rhythm here. This this rhythm's chugging along great. If I literally, if you took your hand and you covered up, if you covered up this section of your, you know, from here back, and you looked at just this rhythm and imagine you did that same thing for six seconds, everything's great. I mean, it's a great rhythm. So, you know, that that's normal. But what happens is when we when we look at the the you know the steps. What's the rate here? So Jack's an overachiever and apparently already counted 15 across here. So I'm just going to believe you. So that rate right now and during this six seconds was about 150 beats a minute. Um, and uh, that's okay. That's way too fast. But is, the, is it regular? Is what's going on here regular? Is what's happening here regular? Well, I'm going to get my beautiful thumbs and I put them up there and I look and I'm like, wow, I got a big space. So right here. Oh, there we go. There's my red pointer. I got a big space. I got another space the same. Then it gets smaller, smaller. But then it's just literally just tiny space. <coughs> hey. <coughs> just come here. Oh. Come here. Yeah, Stitch, Stitch is definitely ha he's having a day. He's, he's, he's not, ha not having the best day. He's, he's not happy. So then I have um, a tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, tiny space, right across here. That's and that's absolutely right. So it gets, but it's regular in the middle, but it's too fast. If you just took this section and you multiplied it times two, then you've got a way really fast rate, right? But then what happens? Well, then somewhere right along this space, it gets normal again, and it's normal. Here it looks just like a, the same as it did before. So it was doing something normal. It did some craziness in the middle, and then it just got back normal again. We see this again when we're going to talk about a ventricular rate. But what happens is it was doing great, then it got just it, it got drunk here in the middle, and then again it did crazy stuff. It's going to regret, and then it went back to. I wasn't talking about you, Stitch. That was one of the YouTube people, not me. Um, and uh, then it goes back to being normal again. But that's the point. There's just this madness in the middle, and that's what we call paroxysm. Um, <laughs> sorry, Francis. Um, sometimes. Sometimes Stitch goes a little, uh, a little crazy. I don't, I don't know why. I, I think he has Tourette's. I mean, it's going to be honest. I, I can always tell when he's about to do it. That's why I pulled him up here because he's just like looking around like he's just about ready to yell. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. So um, as we look here, uh, this is why we call it paroxysmal. It's normal. It comes and then it goes away. So uh, before I talk about that, what somebody already mentioned it once, but when we talk about uh, SVT, it's really important to know that SVT, paroxys paroxysmal SVT, anything that's randomly coming and going, is usually a sign for something that's going to come and stay and be very problematic. This is the same when you think about TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. TIAs, they come and they go and they come and they go, and you're all fine until you get the big one, right? And then it doesn't go away. It's the same with PSVT. If you're somebody who is drinking caffeine, like me, and you're, you know, uh, doing crazy stuff, like me, and what happens is then you, you have an SVT, luckily I don't have PSVT, but then you end up, um, you know, you have bouts of PSVT, what happens is eventually you go into SVT and your body's not able to convert. Um, anytime we go to an irregular rhythm to a normal rhythm, we call that conversion, 
your body's not able to convert back to a regular normal sinus rate. Stitch is giving me like the porno look right now. Let me just do it. Um, but the point is, um, it, what happens is then eventually you're in sustained SVT. And those patients, you can't stay in SVT for very long. Um, some patients can. I mean, yes, they have runs of SVT and they're in SVT for a long time and, and they, you know, then they have to be treated. But what's the drug we need to give for SVT? This is really high yield. You got to know this drug. What's the drug? Uh, somebody already said earlier, I think. Um, that's right. Um, so you've got to give um, adenosine. Um, you've got to give adenosine for sustained SVT. Adenosine uh, interrupts the, the channels in the heart and essentially um, stops the ability for the heart to contract electrically temporarily. And then what happens is um, it basically just restarts. It's the funnest drug to give ever. If you get to do it, um, I recommend getting to see it because you just see a patient at least usually for a second on um, your flatline. And it's the only medication really that you need to give as rapidly as possible because adenosine only has a half-life of just seconds. So it comes, it's there, and it's gone, just like my sex life. Anyway, that's the one bad joke I had today. So another one um, I want to talk about, I talked about what happens, how do we know that things are sinus, right? How do we know that things are sinus? Well, we know they're sinus because we've got those beautiful, wonderful P waves, right? They're right there before every QRS. And what do we call something when there's no P wave? We call that a junctional rhythm. And a junctional rhythm happens whenever we have um, a rhythm that uh, um, doesn't have a P wave that's originating, originating from below the SA node, usually in the AV node or the a, uh, atrioventricular junction. So if I look at this rhythm, what's the rate down here? So let's follow the same pattern. Let's not skip ahead. One, two, three, twelve. I got twelve. I hope it's twelve. So um, so I've got 12 here, um, so at rate of 12, so that's um, 120, so 120 or so. I mean, that's estimated, yes, but it's fast. That's the point, so tachycardia. So then when we look at the rhythm, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you didn't already look, it's beautiful. It's regular all the way across. The R to R's and the P to P, oh, oh, well, the R to R's are great, right? So the R to R's, regular. And then you look at the next one. You look down and you say the P waves. Is there a P wave there before every QRS? No, there's no P wave. What's this? There's no P. That's not the P. That's that's over here. So we're 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 looking at PQRST, PQRST, and then just some madness down here, right? It's not. Um, it's actually the P wave is actually occurring. That's this is actually the P wave down here. But when you when you look at these, so many people get confused and they get hung up, right? You get hung up and you get confused. Like, well, which one's the P? What you should be able to do is identify the QRS, right? If you identify the QRS, then you know that the, the P should be right before it and the T should be after it, right? So you just have to kind of, um, sometimes it requires a little bit of guesswork, but you just end up getting the hang of it, of just understanding that you've got, the, well, there should be a P wave right here causing this. Maybe you would say that little notches, no. So there's the QRS. And then remember, coming back ab above the isometric line, T. Here's our T wave. So this um, this is just a PQRST. This is actually a hidden P wave down here in at the same time of the S. That's really bad. Um, so then we got a PQRST, but there's no P waves. There's no P before the QRS. That's all you got to know. Before the QRS, is there a P? Is it upright and is it visible? No. Um, so then if it's not there, then that means it's a junctional rhythm. The rhythm's originating from the AV, AV node. So that's a PQRST. That's how we know. PR interval, there is no PR interval, so it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to um, uh, you don't have to calculate that because you can't do it. QRS usually is always fine, but you still do it. Um, the widened QRS there's only one box between all those, which means it's 0 0.04 seconds. Beautiful. Now, here I just said this again, just because I, I like to harp on it. Junctional rhythms, um, you know, just think about that. That junctional rhythm means it happens at the junction or below the junction, um, and that's what's important. That's why we call sinus rhythms sinus. Now let's talk about uh, some fun um, fun arrhythmias here. These are fun. Um, when we talk about um, the irregularities, the weird ones, these are ones that are hard. Um, these are ones that are so hard um, to really get down because they're they never appear the same way. You're going to get a rhythm and it's going to look different, uh, but you just follow the process and you'll get it. So let's look at atrial flutter here. What's the rate here? What is the rate? 
about 8, right? The ventricular rate is about 80. Ventricular rate, because the QRS is the ventricular rate. Well, Kendall, you just said all you have to do is count the QRS complexes to get the rate. Yeah, I did, but now we're making it harder. That's the whole point. Um, so you know that the P waves themselves, the P waves are essentially um, atrial depolarization, which should ideally, if electric, the electrical activity is connected to the muscle tissue and working in harmony, every time a P wave happens, that's atrial depolarization. So then we can tell, we can count P waves to count the amount of atrial depolarization or the atrial rate. So what's the atrial rate here? Well, you could just literally count all the way across again and then multiply by 30, right? Uh, but um, the, uh, what you want to do is you want to see how many, Q, how many there are to each QRS complex. How many, it's called, we, we call it the, um, uh, how many there are to each one. So it's like a one, three to one, a two to one, a four to one. So there are these little weird waves. What are these? These are really weird. Well, you see how these look almost like shark teeth, like a shark tooth or a saw, like a, if you ever use a saw. I'm from West Virginia, so I've seen lots of saws. Um, so um, the uh, important thing here is um, the um, knowing that these rate, right? It looks like a sawtooth. They're called flutter waves. Now, you can, there isn't there isn't much in with ECGs that you can just memorize. But every time you see um, one QRS complex and this little boop, 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 all the way across in beautiful harmony, those are almost always sawtooth waves. They're called flutter waves. And when you see those, these are essentially not P waves, but what happens is these are atrial depolarization. And you can see how many there are to each QRS complex, one, two, three. So there's about, th no, nah, there's actually, well, there's three or four to each QRS. So you can see that that atrial rate's much faster than the um, ventricular rate. So when you look at the rhythm, is this rhythm regular or irregular? Well, if it's regular, that means there's one P before every QRS. The R to R's and the P to P's are um, a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's correct. So it's an irregular rate. And this is where it gets confusing. Is it doing the same thing over and over? Is it regularly irregular? Or is it doing literally there's no pattern whatsoever? Well, if I folded this into an origami set and like you know took it and cut it and laid them all over top of each other, it's doing the same thing over and over and over. People would be very cautious to call this regular. Well, it's irregular, but it's regularly irregular. It's doing the same thing wrong over and over and over again. So that's regularly irregular. That's right. Um, it's always weird for me when I see, I'm so used to like our go to webinar stuff and other things and it. It has like a name on there and uh, whatever, it has whatever you type in. And then YouTube, it shows up who, whatever the weird name is when you signed up. So um, it just, it's funny for me uh, with some of people's names, uh, duck butt. So anyway, um, you can see that this is irregularly irregular. P waves, well, you can't really tell that they're there, but those are those characteristic sawtooth waves, flutter waves. So that's why we call this atrial flutter. And of course, this can be very fast. I mean, you can have way, way crazy rates. What's wrong with all of these atrial arrhythmias? The atrial arrhythmias have problems because what happens is if the, when you know um, when, um, when the, ventric the ventricles uh, or the atria relax, what happens when that happens? Well, they fill with blood. If the atria contract and contract and contract and contract and contract and contract really fast, they never slow down to catch a breath and fill with blood to be able to pump blood into the ventricles. So what happens is they, they're just going at a fast rate, right? I can't, I can't do this at the, at the at the right speed and correlation. But the point is, the atria never stop contracting at this fast rate, so the ventricles are able, never able to actually, the, the atria are never able to fill completely with blood, so then they can't pump enough blood to the, to, the, um, to the ventricles. And then, of course, you have decreased cardiac output, which then just further exacerbates the problem. Here's a couple of examples of flutter waves. And this is important because this is one that I feel like you can try to identify very easy. But the waves always kind of look like this sawtooth pattern. These are not pointy waves like the last one, but they are very characteristically, they're literally flutter waves. They're all the way across the board. Here's a two to one ratio. So there's two to one. Here's a 
three and then four to one, so four to one ratio, so four to one ratio. So you can kind of see the difference there and how the cardiac output is different and um, how it, um, uh, how you'd have problems with cardiac output if you had four to one versus two to one. And that's absolutely right because you would have a lot decreased blood flow. Now the most uh, high yield one that you absolutely have got to be able to identify, and I feel like it's the one curveball that comes out of nowhere um, that so many people have trouble with, um, is uh, is atrial fibrillation. So how do we identify atrial fibrillation? How do we identify atrial fibrillation? How do we how do we identify atrial fib? Well, let's look at the rate. Follow the exact same process. Don't skip ahead. So how many, there, there's a QRS right here, by the way, right behind this little atria heart alarm clock, um, who's, um, who's freaking out for fibrillation. So how many, how many, what's the speed here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, right? Sorry. So there's nine. So the, the, um, the ventricular rate's about 90. Now, okay, let's just go with that for now. What's the rhythm? What's the rhythm? Well, get your beautiful thumbs out and take a look. Well, it's wide, it's wide, then it's short, then it's wider, then it's shorter, then it's wide, then it's really short, then it's wider, then it's really wide. It's not doing the same thing. There's no, no distance between any of these is the same. Well, why would that distance be changing? Well, what causes the QRS complex to fire? The QRS, the QRS complex, fi the QRS complex fires because of, um, uh, an atrial impulse, right? The firing from the SA node goes down to the AV junction, then bam, causes the, the, the QRS complex to fire, the atrial depolarization. So is this regular or irregular? Well, it's irregular, right? So if it's irregular, then um, is it irregularly regular, or regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular? Well, there's no discernible pattern. Um, there's no discernible pattern whatsoever. And if you tried to go ahead and try to find the P to P, you can't. You can't find the P to P because where are the P waves? Well, here's where you, you have the difference between what we would call junctional rhythm and fibrillation. Fibrillation, fibrillatory waves are just imagine quivering, right? Quivering, 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 fire, quivering, 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 fire, quivering, fire, quivering, fire. It's like, it's really just like being, um, being, uh, uh, electrocuted, I guess, you know, or, or tased at just a random interval because you're like freaking out and then you, you just fire, fire. Uh, but it's no pattern to it whatsoever. And that's exactly what fibrillatory waves are. So where's the P wave? Well, um, let's just start right here. So that that might be a P wave. No, QRST, no P wave, QRST. There's a P wave right there, right? Um, QRST, nothing, QRST, QRST. T, Q, R, S, T, nothing. There's no P waves. There's no discernible P waves. And um, you can tell that it, it's getting regular all over the place. Uh, and that's how we can tell that this is irregularly irregular. And every time you get an irregularly irregular rhythm and you have QRS complexes that are changing distance over time, it's very likely that it's atrial fibrillation. Um, unless you don't have a decent, if you have wide QRS complexes, that's obviously a much more serious problem. But that's where you should always have on the tip of your tongue atrial fibrillation, because you're always going to get this thrown at you because it's so common um, as people age and they end up with um, uh, atrial, you know, atrial, atrial fib. What's the big problem with it? We worry about because the atria are just quivering and the ventricles are contracting and the atria are quivering and contract and then randomly, and they're not working in unison. That means, again, the blood flow from the atria are not going to the ventricles, and if the ventricles aren't able to fill, then it's not going out to the rest of the body. That's absolutely right. So um, what what do we do for this? Well, there's lots of things we can do for atrial fibrillation, but you got to worry about the uh, long-term problems because you can develop blood clots in the um, right atria, in the atrium, and those can travel out to the body and cause strokes and other problems, um, and um, that's really uh, the big worry with, uh, with AFib. So they're probably going to be put on coagulation therapy. Um, and of course, we can um, uh, cardiovert those patients as well. We can give them medications to help slow their heart rate down, calcium channel blockers like um, diltiazem or cardizem, that's right. So here's a good example, just a little a weird one um, that sometimes, I just want to mention this because I hear it all the time, um, atria, atrial fibrillation with RVR. You've probably heard that. I remember when I heard that the first time, I didn't know what the heck um, 
I didn't I didn't know what the heck that was. It means it's a rapid ventricular response. That means essentially the atria were, were misfiring and fibrillating. And what happened was at some point those the ventricle ventricles um, got a rapid ventricular response and started beating at a super fast rate. So it's a very high ventricular tachycardia that's very irregular. And this is very difficult to determine the difference between rapid uh, atrial fib with RVR versus supraventricular tachycardia. It's very difficult to distinguish and that's why you need to get a 12 lead to be able to get the difference. Um, and that's definitely um, uh, definitely uh, a thing. Um, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, so uh, we'll move on. So let's talk about the cardiac arrest algorithms here just, um, just so we can go over these before we finish up. So monomorphic VTAC. Now, first off, there's monomorphic and monomorphic rather and polymorphic. Mono means one. Morphic means changes. So one change, ventricular tachycardia. So it's going to look like the same every time. So first off, what's the rate here? Well, I can tell you that these are giant QRS complexes. And this is every time you see something like this. If you see something uh, like a, uh, you know, big giant wide, it's probably a, could be a PVC or it's a giant QRS complex. So how many are there? Eighteen. I think I counted real quick. So there's about eighteen of those QRS complexes across there. So maybe there's seventeen. I don't know. So there's eighteen. The point is, it's very fast. It's a very fast rate. Very fast. Way too fast for the six second strip. And that means about 180 beats a minute. Now what's the rhythm? What's the rhythm? Looking across all of those peaks there, it's pretty regular. It's pretty regular. But is it regularly? Is it is it a regular rhythm or is it irregularly irregular. Well, it's irregular because there's no P, P to P and R to R in synchrony because you can't see a P to P. But what there is, is it's doing the same thing the whole time. It literally looks the same all the way across. And that makes it's doing the same thing over and over, so it's irregularly regular or regularly irregular, however you want to put it. I always say those um, uh, and I swap, swap the words, so it means the same. So anyway, look at P waves. There's none here. There's no P waves. Um, there's no there's no P waves present. You can't see anything. You see nothing but giant ventricular re, um, contractions because of these giant QRSs. The PR interval, of course, then means it's absent. And the QRS here is giant. So where's the QRS? Are there more than three boxes in between all of this? Yes, there's five, six, there's seven boxes of QRS in between here. So seven times four is 28, so 0.28 seconds of a, um, of a uh, QRS complex. It's very wide tachycardia. Wide tachycardias are often ventricular tachycardia is usually what it means. What do I do with this rhythm? What's the treatment here? Give them a hug, right? Just give them a hug. So the first thing you want to do is always, if you see a rhythm like this, check the patient. Um, check the patient. And what do you need to do to check the patient for? You need to check their pulse. Um, because you can have ventricular tachycardia and be talking, walking just fine. Now, you can't do that for very long, but you can do it. Um, and that's what's, that's what's really important. Um, it doesn't work forever, but you can do it. Um, and that's, that's right. Um, you know, you can see that uh, um, definitely the important thing is um, that it, it's, um, you've got to check for that pulse. Because if they don't have a, you, you, the ACLS algorithms with this one, this is just a trick question that always pops up. Um, it's a big um, paramedic, nursing, medical school, all of them. What's the first thing you do? Check the patient. One, because it's easy to you know, look like it's, they have VTAC if the patient is moving, if they're on the monitor. Number two, um, pulseless VTAC is treated differently versus um, VTAC without a pulse. If you don't have a pulse, you need CPR and, and um, defibrillation. If you have a VTAC with a pulse, you have to be cardioverted. So you need to be electrically cardioverted, synchronous. Um, using a synchronous cardio version, meaning uh, just works differently. So I hope you know the difference of those. Um, so I just got those three different um, differences here of what the things you need to do differently. I'm not going to go over it in big detail because I am running way behind. Um, so for polymorphic VTAC, it's just different. Now this is where you have torsades de point, um, and I'm sure I butchered that French name, but um, uh, is de point uh, uh, and uh, torsades is what we call it. Polymorphic VTAC. Well, what does polymorphic mean? That means it's changing. Um, it's multiple changes in ventricular tachycardia. But let's not skip the process. What's the rate? Super fast to the end, right? What's the rhythm? Well, it's irregular, and it's irregularly irregular. Now, what was the other irregularly irregular rhythm that we had? 
atrial fibrillation, right? Well, this one also is irregularly irregular. Polymorphic VTAC. Now, polymorphic VTAC, look for those P waves. No P waves. Is it junctional? No, just VTAC. I mean, it technically is a type of junctional, but it's, it's, uh, it's VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. PR interval is gone. But reason it's VTAC is we look at that QRS interval and it's wide. Every single one of these ugly QRS complexes are really wide. I mean, if you, you could put your whole thumb in there if you had tiny thumbs. Thank goodness I don't have tiny thumbs. All the way across here you can see um, you can see the big giant, um, big giant wide QRS complexes. So you can see that's greater than 0 0.12 seconds or 0 0.10. Either way, three boxes big. What do we worry about this? Well, polymorphic VTAC is uh, often torsades de pointism can be caused by several different things. It can be caused by, um, there's a conduction defect that can cause torsades. There's um, R on T phenomenon can cause torsades. But what's important to know about this is that it imme needs immediate um, uh, defibrillation, right? These patients are in big trouble. Now, you could have a bout of this, a short paroxysmal bout, but remember what we know about anything that's paroxysmal? You need to be worried about it. Um, so these patients usually have a, an impending cardiac arrest, or they, well, this is cardiac arrest, but um, you know, they usually it doesn't go well after this. So we need to make sure we're worried about these. What's the medication we give people with this? What, what's the medication? Hmm, if there was only a medication that relaxed muscles. Ooh, yeah, I don't know. I just can't think of it, right? These patients are often going to be given magnesium, right? They're going to get, end up getting magnesium to, um, to calm the muscles down, especially because they're very irritated. Just like any time things, something's fibrillated, it's just twitching all over the place. Twitch, 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 fibrillating. Fibrillatory waves. Now, um, oh, I already got this. I already kind of talked about the slides. Let me skip. Oh, maybe I didn't. Yeah, I did. Sorry. Now, the next one I want to talk about is um, ventricular fibrillation. So, ventricular fibrillation. This is something I just want you to really um, not just guess every time you just see a squiggly line, you just guess VFib. Please don't do that um, because it's pretty easy to be able to tell. Um, let's look at the rate here. What's the rate? I can't tell the rate, Kendall. That's absolutely right. Great answer. What's the rhythm? It's a bunch of chaotic mess. I can't tell. Absolutely right. Good answer. Where are the P waves? Look, what am I, a magician? I don't see any P waves. What's a PR interval? This is not funny. Um, and that's right, you, there's no, nothing is discernible. But what's important here is, is that there is nothing discernible at all, ever. There's no discernible pattern. Now, when I look back, if I go backwards and look differently at polymorphic VTAC, look at these giant, beautiful waves in here. I mean, these are, these are beautiful, giant VTAC waves. VTAC waves always look like this. Well, not always. They can be a little shorter. I mean, and, and I think they get upset when they're the shorter ones. They're, they usually look like these, these waves right here, these short ones, these little short fat ones, or these big, beautiful tall ones. And that's not a discrimination joke against short, fat people. I was, uh, I'm short and fat. Anyway, the point is, I'm going to get so many hate comments for this. So I guess it's a good thing it's my last uh, Picmonic webinar today, I guess. Um, the point is, there's no discernible pattern whatsoever. It's literally just, just you know, it's quivering all over the place. It's not doing any kind of, if I was to isolate this and throw it into a normal rhythm, it's nothing that would look like anything of a QRS complex, right? It's not really anything that I can tell. And that's absolutely what is important. Now, as you go through this um, and you look at this, it's like, well, what's the difference between a, this and AFib? Well, this is not a atrial fibrillation because atrial fibrillation is usually very, um, very short, very fine waves, whereas ventricular fibrillation is a lot of larger waves. Look at the isometric line. It literally goes all the way, well, I can't move my cursor all the way across very well, but it's literally if a beautiful line all the way across the middle, and there's literally deflections above and below. Then atrial fibrillation is just going to be little tiny deflections above because those are P waves which go above the isometric line. This is going above and below but not in giant, beautiful waves. And it's very chaotic. There's no pattern. That's ventricular fibrillation. Now, there's a difference. Um, one of the things of, we, we do call this sometimes coarse VFib, which is what, we, what, what I just showed you. And then there is something technically called fine ventricular fibrillation, which is literally just a whole bunch of nothing all the way across here. You may see people um, sometimes 
uh, you know, treat this like an uh, asystole rhythm or whatnot, um, or try to call asystole fine V fib and, and shock it. Um, I, I think that's a debatable thing. And, you know, this is fine V fib, debatably. Um, and that's just where it's because it's not as tall. Now, the last one, asystole, A means without in medical terminology. One of the biggest things you need to learn in medicine is making sure you know medical terms so you can get all of this stuff correct. A means without, systole means uh, systole, so con the contraction without, without contraction, cardiac standstill. So what happens? Well, there's nothing, the end, we're done, right? There's the, What's the rate? There's no rate. Now, there may be P waves there. That's what's really important. You can have a systole and you could still have some P waves in here. Maybe there's just one little blip of a P wave. And that's one of the biggest things I struggled with when I when I first became a paramedic was uh, really being able to say, okay, well, what's the deal here? You know, being able to, um, you know, there's still electrical activity. We should do something. Well, it's still asystole, unfortunately, because there's still electrical firing that may be happening in the atria, which could cause, um, you know, um, uh, atrial depolarization, but the heart may not actually be responding. So there's nothing absolutely dependent. Well, there's no, um, nothing going on. And that is asystole, um, and that's really um, all you have to know about that. I think it's the easiest one to know because it's just nothing, right? Here's a good example of our P wave asystole. So there's still a, a, an electrical activity firing at the SA node, but there's nothing going on elsewise. It's all done, went to sleep, and it's just gone. P wave, and there's nothing else, and that's what you need to know. One really important one, and don't you miss this trick, is pulseless electrical activity. P-E-A, right? It really, look at this rhythm. What's the rhythm here? This is beautiful. What's this person's pulse rate? Uh, pulse rate's zero. But the heart rate, the electrical heart rate is measured, and it's probably, what is it, 120? I don't know. It's beautiful. It's, it's a good, nice, beautiful rate. But the thing of it is, is you may have electrical activity in the cardiac monitor, but the patient may actually not have a pulse. That's where you always need to make sure you have that rule of check your patient, treat your patient, not the monitor, um, because this one could get you in trouble. Um, I don't see beautiful PEA that often, maybe more than once in my entire life. Um, that's like at a rate of like 50 um, that I thought was sustainable for life. But that was just because there were so many drugs given that the electrical activity I felt like had to at least be going on. Um, but then fortunately the heart muscle just wasn't responding. So here's our same uh, review of going over what you need to know. Follow this same process. Just do it. What's the rate? Is it slow? Is it regular? Or is it fast? Um, is it and what what's the rhythm doing? Is it doing the same thing over and over, or is it just doing a bunch of crap all over the place? What's the P waves? One before every QRS is the most important, and then of course each one they need to be upright and consistent. They need to look the same all the way across. What's that PR interval? Less than 0.2 seconds. Super important to make sure that PR interval is less than 0.2 seconds. And then looking at the QRS last, which is depending on what book you look at, it's 0.10 to 0.12 seconds or less, or three small block boxes. If you see in things that are wide QRSs, those are usually ventricular rhythm, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, um, and that's just what you know. And as uh, I think Jack mentioned earlier, we give, after, after any kind of arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, after the fact, we usually give lidocaine, and that's right. So guys, um, that's all we have in here for our um, webinar today. Um, I'm glad you could join us. I'm so sorry for the problems that we had with our, if you were on our GoToWebinar side, I hope you jumped over to YouTube so you could join us. Uh, DuckButt3385, I am not going over the heart blocks today, and I am sorry, but I can tell you, um, I do make lots of videos myself. Um, you can follow us on YouTube um, at Picmonic Video. You can look on YouTube for my channel if you want um, and follow me myself because um, I've uh, been making lots of videos myself. Um, and we'll be making some on heart blocks just because I have a lot of really bad corny jokes for that And I think it would just be a lot of fun um, But um, I am this is actually my last webinar with Picmonic um, Aside from any kind of guest appearances that I'll be doing in the future because I am going off to residency So you'll have to find me otherwise um, So I'm um, sorry about that, but maybe I'll be in as a guest maybe in the future. I don't know um, I can't guarantee anything um, but what I do know is this is definitely my last one. If you have any questions specifically, you want to check out Picmonic, I absolutely recommend it and love Picmonic. You should check it out. Um, go to um, Pic, um, at, oh, I can't even talk. Check out Picmonic for free uh, on the website, picmonic.com. You can also email. If you have any questions, um, you can go to go in there and actually email them feedback, feedback at Picmonic video. 
um, as well. You can follow me on Twitter at Pikmonic Kindle, and then you can um, also sign up, and you can just message us straight from our site. In the back background, we've got Marley, who is our um, who is our uh, master nursing scholar, who also has been answering lots of your guys' questions on YouTube as well as GoToWebinar. But other than that, guys, um, we appreciate it, and as always, good luck studying.